Kitty Kitties, what up, what up? Welcome to Primal Scream. This is your host, Nick Greystone. For the next hour, we're going to talk about fantasy, reality, and everything in between. Let's go. Hello, children. Kitty Kitties, everyone out there. Yes, you don't have to adjust your TV, your mobile device, or anything else that you're watching me on right now. It is Nick Greystone. That's right. I am back. And this is Primal Scream. It's been a while. It's been a long while since I've um, conned live on Primal Scream. Um, but with everything comes a story. And there's a good reason. Back in December, um, your boy was at it, going at it hard, you know. Uh, I feel like I was on autopilot for a very, very, very long time. Um, and it reached a point where I had to take a little step back, take a, uh, a breather. And get myself all right. And realize that it's okay not to be okay. And I know that sounds cliche, but it's very true. And for those of that of you that know me, and know me personally, um, just to... I, I'm as transparent as, as they come, you know. I try to tell you, like, what I'm feeling. Sometimes it's too much. And um, when... I reached this point where um, I was letting little things get the best of me, and I had all this anxiety, and I had to uh, go get myself checked out. So I did that, and I took a little step back, not without a great support system behind me, you know, my, uh, my peeps that I can always depend on were there. And I want to thank them for doing that. I'd also like to thank uh, Tony, because Tony, uh, you know, my co my co producer over here, uh, he reached out to me. I left him hanging one night, and I do apologize about that. And I wanted to go on air and just tell him about that that I do feel that I do owe him that um, apology for not being there when I was supposed to be, and. Um, you know, sorry about that, Tony. I really am, man. I, I, I'm glad that governors and you and the people that care about this show uh, reached out because it made me feel like I was wanted, and um, that was cool. So enough of the sensitive bullshit. Let's get back to work. Um, there's so much to talk about. You know, I've, I've been gone for seven months, but in that seven months, uh, lots of things have happened, you know, um, obviously life goes on and everything, and, um, you know, the band was still firing on all cylinders, I'll get into a cool uh, little thing that we did in that time frame, we have a new single coming out next week, which is awesome, um, I'm still doing my, my Nizza solo stuff, which is still taking off. Uh, the Forest Hills, finally, there is light at the end of the tunnel that is actually coming out in, uh, sometime in October. Sweet Meats right now is in the final stages of sound, and that looks like it's being released in October too. So it's going to be a fun fall weekend and uh fun fall season for everyone that I guess are fans of the shit that I do. Someone that's not going to have a, uh, a fun fall, I feel, it's actually a, a very rapid fall right now, is uh, alleged serial killer Rex Heuerman. Uh Today, um, Rex, if you, know, you live under a rock and you haven't heard the news yet, but he, uh, he is a, he's already been charged with four murders and that's the original Gilgo four um uh, Megan Waterman Amber Costello 
Melissa Bartholomew, and Maureen Brainerd Barnes. Today, Ray Tierney uh, had a press conference out east, and uh, Rex was back in court, and they linked him to two more murders. Uh, you see the cover of Newsday today, Jessica Taylor and Sandra Castilla uh, were two victims. Uh, Jessica Taylor, uh, she was found in Manorville back in 2003. Well, part of her was, her torso was. Um, and then about eight months later, they found her hands, her forearms, and her skull about um, a quarter of a mile from the original Gilgo 4. Sandra Castilla, uh, she was found in 1993 in North Sea. Um, John Bitroff, uh, who is already serving time right now, um, has always been the main suspect. But now, because of DNA, um, they were able to exclude Bitroff as a suspect. And they found hair linking to Rex and to a woman who is still remained uh, unidentified that lived in the Huberman home back in 1992, 93. Um, maybe it's his first wife. We don't know. Um, you know, he was married back in 1990, and that marriage only lasted a short period. But um, they found... Um, hair linking to his and there's like a 99.96 percent that it's him uh on in both cases you know they found hair with jessica taylor as well under a tarp um where her torso was found so they have all that but then they were talking about other stuff that they had found at the press conference and they found these pornographic images ex accessed by Hureman notably and largely coincide with how the remains of Taylor and Castillo were found, according to the court documents. So, what, what I'm leading to believe is these images were taken by Rex, and it's possibly the images of what he did. So they found these images on, a, I believe, a, um, a card, a SIM card for a phone uh, or some type of uh, tablet or something linking back to him. So we'll find out what exactly that means. Um, again, you know, I'm only the armchair detective. I don't know exactly all the technical terms and all that other stuff. But I'm only reading this stuff and coming to assumptions on exactly what it all means. You know, they released a 36-page document of his bail, uh, like the, the, the charges that he was up against. So there's so much in it that I haven't even gotten through it all. And I was just reading some stuff. Supposedly... There was a hard drive that they recovered in the basement of um, his house that had this Microsoft Word document, and it was titled HK 2002-04, which it seems that it's a planning document, um, and the document was separated into four sections, Problems, Supplies, DS... And TRG, TRG. So, problems seems to be a guide to avoid apprehension. And it includes points like DNA, tire marks, blood stains, fingerprints, witnesses, photos, police stop, and plastic bags matched. So, he's making a list, basically a blueprint, on how he was going to do the crime... And it's ultimately try to get away with it. So he has one section, like I said, that was the problems that he would come across. 
Here's another one that says supplies, which appear to be items that he needs to carry out serial murder. So this section includes bullet points on booties, acid, rope cord, saw, cutting, tools, burn cans, tarps, and bags and tape. DS has been deciphered to me dub site, and according to court documents, the discovery of Jessica Taylor and another potential victim, Valerie Mack, were at two different dump sites. So now that I'm saying Valerie Mack, um, Valerie Mack is still uh, not tied to anybody. She was also found in Manorville, but now they're saying that Rex is a suspect with her murder. Now, you know, what I'm going to say is that if they're already saying that he's a suspect, they probably have something that's going to link him to this. So... This is only the beginning, I feel. Now that if they're busting out this stuff and they're saying that they're coming up with Word documents and they're finding pictures and, you know, they went back into the house, there's no way that they're going to compromise a crime scene that was already basically closed. Go back in there and take stuff out because, you know, if you had any type of um, attorney, you know, worth their salt... They're going to say that they are going back into a compromised crime scene. And they could have tampered evidence. And this shit can get turned, thrown right out. So, unless this is like bulletproof and 100% like incriminating towards Rex, I don't think they would waste their time. Because, really, Suffolk County Police, they need beyond a home run. They need a fucking grand slam with this. And I think that... They're doing a great job as far as going step by step, and they have to be as transparent with everybody through each step. And I feel like it's only the beginning. I feel like they're going to tie this guy to so many more different crimes. And um, the third part to this that they found in this planning document is a, a category. There's like three different categories, and it's pre-prep, prep, and pro post-event. So... He's writing everything that he would do, basically, if he was to kill, carry it out, dump the body, and ultimately cover up his tracks. So, that's really, um, <laughs> it's really incriminating, you know? Like, I don't even know, um, what else, really, other than, you know, with the DNA that they they have on him already... To me, this is already seems like a victory. I mean, like, you know, they have him tied to six victims. I know there's another, um, from the Gilgo site, I believe there's another uh, seven that are not um, tied to anybody right now. And I feel like they want to connect him to all these. But now that this one girl, Castilla, was found in the North Sea... This opens up different areas. It also opens up different um, cases that he could have been. It seems that his his M.O. was he was doing all this stuff when his family was away. So now they have to look at when the family was away or if when he was away. He could have been doing stuff in different states. So, you know, remember they found that avalanche of his that was spotted in different um, areas during these crimes they found that in South Carolina you know so it's 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 something you know it's um, shaping up to be um, a very huge case I said that from day one and that's why you know when this broke that's how this whole podcast even really got off the ground is because once this broke I felt like I had to get out there and you know, I wanted to be not part of it, but I wanted to see it unfold because, you know, true crime is like a passion of mine that I follow. I follow these cases. You know, I'm not in some dark room getting myself off on these crimes and everything. I look at, you know, the story. You know, Rex Human looked like a normal guy from the outside. You know, he looked like your next door neighbor. He looked like he blended in, you know, and then all of a sudden 
they show up and they're saying that this guy's responsible for all these murders, you know, that's usually how it starts. And now this case was cold for so long, and now all of a sudden all these, uh, you know, news is coming out and everything. So, again, it's the beginning, and we'll see what happens. And uh, it's an unbelievable uh, day for this case, you know. And um, I don't know what's going to happen now as far as them going forward with the, uh, the next step. They said that the original Gilgo 4 part of it is done. They're going to continue looking into the other possible cases. I'm sure now that they're saying that he's a suspect with Valerie Mack, I'm sure they're going to look into that. Now, getting into this with Sandra Castilla and what I said before about uh, Bitroff, Bitroff was convicted of two murders back in... Um, my dates are all messed up because, like, this whole day I've been looking at different uh, different things. He was convicted of two murders for two women that they found in Manorville. Now, let's just say an innocent man is behind bars because Bitroff from day one has said he's innocent. Could it be possible that Rex is the one that did these murders and now there's an innocent man behind bars? We're going to find that out. You know, they can, maybe they'll reopen up his case because, you know, Bitroff has been trying to get a, an appeal with this. Up until now, he's been denied, but maybe now they'll uh, look into it and see if uh, Rex is the one, you know. Um, John Ray was on uh, on the scene today, and um, I wasn't there. Um, so I don't know exactly as to everything that was said. Um, and again... I'm only saying what I've read, and um, there's actually going to be a part two to my podcast thing tonight. After my show, I'm going to be on a special guest on um, My True Crime Obsession that's coming on up after me, and uh, we're going to be talking in great detail about this case. So um, Christine, who runs that, she was there today. She took some pictures. She um, has a bunch of uh, different points that she wants to bring up, so I really want to get into the case and talk to her about that as well. So um, I just wanted to uh, basically give you the little uh, the cliff notes that I came across, which was a lot still, you know, but there's still more that can be discussed about this, and that's why I don't want to, uh, you know, talk about the, the, um, the case the whole time for my uh for the show tonight so um yeah it's it's a crazy day um i'm sure um there's so many um questions that are not answered um where is his family during all this i know they said that they were away but like you know this guy they're saying that there's a possibility that he kept people hostage inside his home how can you hide that you know like there's only so much you could really hide from somebody i mean like if you're leading a double life like you know and it's not just one person you had three adults living in this house with him at the time you know um well not adults too his kids were young at that point when uh this all started but you know like it's there's so many head scratches about this, so uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll see what happens. And you know, like I, like I've been doing my updates and everything, and I'll keep you guys updated as far as hearing stuff and uh, what I come across. And um, yeah, um, like I said, I was telling Tony when I came back last night, um, I started getting the itch. Again, to come back and talk because I went back down to the to the house and I got interviewed by News 12. And then I went there for a couple of days back to the house and they had the whole uh, street closed off and it was like deja vu. And it was just like a whole new like resurgence on like what was going on. So, um, yeah, it feels good. It feels good to be back and everything like uh do you have anything to add, Tony, like about this whole thing? And we were talking a little bit before about it. Uh, 
I know what you were saying about him keeping people possibly in the basement, like how he could have done that. Yeah, that's uh, well. Yeah, that's suppose that's one of the questions. Now they think that some people may not have been killed right away, and that just uh, that's I don't know. That's I think a lot of people's worst fear, man, is just being tortured, uh, kind of like being buried alive or something. You know, just going through that constant torture twenty four seven. Um, but uh, but then you you it. I think it's just natural to wonder what you know. How does other people in the house not know that this is going on, that there's somebody in their house. I I don't know. I There's so many questions. Right. So many questions. Like, uh, I feel like the, um, the whole thing with living with, like, a narcissist, there's a possibility, very limited possibility, but let's just say from what it comes across as that Rex is an extreme narcissist, which you can see, like... You know, the video that he posted about him talking and stuff, he kind of looked like a dick. You know, I, I don't know the guy personally, but that's kind of like he was full of himself or whatever. I met him once, and he was uh, not exactly a friendly person. Okay. So let's just say, for argument's sake, that he was a narcissist to the 10th power. And he did all this stuff. When you're living with a narcissist and they're doing their own thing and they're in their own world and they're entertaining themselves rather than trying to be the center of attention that they're trying to get, um, I feel like sometimes stuff can go unnoticed. Like, all right, great. You know, Rex ain't home. Fuck it. I don't care. I, <laughs> he's out of my hair, you know? Right. He's busting someone else's balls or he's breaking someone else's neck and burying them in the fucking brush or whatever the fuck he's doing, you know? So there's a possibility that that could have went on, you know? I just, uh, it sucks that this family has to go through it too, because I feel like, you know, they're victims too as well. I mean, you know, yep. I agree. You know, it's shitty. It's a real shitty thing for everyone. Now he, Again, today when these charges were brought, he, they're saying that he showed no remorse in the courtroom and that he also pled not guilty to this. Now, there's only two reasons why he's doing this, I feel. It's either he's waiting for it to all unfold so that he can let it go through the court system and they, he can show exactly what type of monster he is because he wants to Absolutely. be that notorious. Yes. Or... He's seen how much he can get away with and then been like, you know, oh, well, you didn't catch this. And now he's cooperating and maybe spark a deal. But from day one, they're already saying, like Ray Tierney's saying that there's no deals involved. Because, I mean, New York doesn't have the death penalty, but maybe some of these other states do. That if he's crossing state lines and then the FBI gets involved and stuff, they could bring him up on federal charges. <clears throat> yeah, but... I, it- you really struck a chord a few minutes ago when you said, you know, the fact that they're going back in when, you know, they, they can, the defense can have a field day with the fact that all this time, you know, there was time in between the two times they did a search. Yeah. It, that's a little, that's a little concerning. Well, court cases get thrown out. Look at fucking OJ. That yeah, happened exactly. in one night. Right. Now you're talking about fucking eight months. Right. Eight months of people living inside that house. Eight months of cross-contamination. And then all of a sudden, oh, well, we have to take these panels off that. has still been in the house. God knows what could have went on in that, you yep. know? Right. right. They could have been like, you know what? We need something. We need something. Maybe we could go in there. Here, you got a piece of hair? Let's throw it down here. Oh, my God, look <clears throat> what we found, you know? And I think I'll even throw out the fact that if, what's his lawyer's name? Brown? Uh, Michael yeah. Brown? If he he's probably watching right now, and if he didn't think of that already, he just did. So you you know, so he's got you to thank. Oh wow! <laughs> you welcome, Rex. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. So now, if anybody, so I'm a suspect. If anybody's glad you're back, it's Rex. <laughs> oh, fuck, man! I should have kept my mouth shut. My father was always right, man. He always told me, "When are you gonna learn to keep that fucking mouth shut?" <laughs> never, Daddy. I'm never gonna do it. <laughs> <laughs> good to have you back, man. It's good to see you. And, Thank uh, you, sir. I appreciate uh, it. This is fun. Absolutely. 
So, all right, to uh, change the subject, uh, like I said, Christine's going to come in here in a little bit. We're going to do My True Crime Obsession, and then we're going to get really into the case because uh, she's got a bunch of uh, stuff that she went through today and got some cool pictures and stuff, and uh, see what she has to say about it. So, like I said, you know, in the time that I was off, um, the Scar, you know, Demon Scar, we've been in the studio, we've been recording and everything, and um, we had one hell of a show on St. Patrick's Day. Um, we were invited to take part in Hate Breed's um, anniversary show in uh, Wallingford, Connecticut. Now, um, it was an uh, amazing time. Uh, they rolled out the carpet for us, treated us so kind and everything. Um, it was a great show. It was, it was Hate Breed, Shadows Fall, Shadow of Intent, 100 Demons, um, Dead by Wednesday, Eyes of the Living, and, and us. We kicked off the day. And... Um, it was uh, it was something you know like there was all different types of awesome press that we got. Um, oh, and Sworn Enemy, I left them out. Sorry, Sworn Enemy. Um, we got so much good press, like uh, Death Moth Press and All Music Magazine. Um, Holly Roy took some awesome pictures. Mia P took some awesome pictures. Um, Daniel Jackson from my aunt music wrote this awesome article about us and he i'm just going to quote something that was said uh demon scar from long island they wasted no time brutalizing the crowd in the dome with chugging riffs and uh we are here in your face taste of aggression the show was expected to be one for the books from the flyer alone but to have a lineup with bands like this opening up and setting the bar for the night really locks in the mindset and excitement level for all those that came to throw down. And it really was. I mean, like, the sound system was awesome. Um, it was in one of these old school, like, theaters. And um, they hate breed Shadows Fall, Shadow of Intent, and 100 Demons. They all played inside the dome. Like, we played... Uh, there was a second stage set up in the on the outside part uh, in the lobby. And it was weird. We had set up. We did like a sound check. And we had about 10 minutes before we came on. And someone came in the back. And they're like, dude, there's already like a line down the block. And it's packed. And we were kicking it off. It was 12 o'clock in the afternoon. We felt like, ah, oh, you know what? Maybe there'll be like, you know, 50, 60 people. We fucking open up the curtain. There's already like five or six hundred people inside the building already. And we're like, holy shit. And they were ready to go. And it was just a, a great turnout. Um, as you could see, these pictures that they took were pretty amazing. And um, I just want to thank Jamie Josta. Like, Jamie Josta um, is a true professional. Like, he puts on an amazing show. He does not forget where he came from. He has an, a band that started just like I feel like how Demon Scar started, like, you know, with, like, word of mouth, getting getting their name out there, and that self-promotion that they did to a level now that they're, like, one of the best hardcore bands to ever do it, you know? And now uh, he's even doing, like, a solo thing right now. So um, I actually want to play a song off of his new album, um, and Josta for all, uh, it's called suicidality. Uh, and it's with, uh, Phil Demel from machine head. So I have a video that, uh, I'm going to show and, uh, we'll talk about it when, uh, when we get back. Mentally infecting the distress 
All right, that was uh, Suicidality from uh, Jasta's new album, uh, Jasta for All. Um, you watching that? I'm watching that video, and uh, it's pretty cool. Like they filmed that at the rave um, where they had the Milwaukee Metal Fest, um, and it's cool. Jasta's there's a part where he's in the pool. Um, basically, everyone goes down there. Like all oh, there's like all these signatures inside this place such a cool like vintage club inside milwaukee and everything and that just watching that video brought back memories because i feel like they shot that video um they shot that video uh during that weekend of uh milwaukee metal fest from last year so um again you know it's a cool a cool vibe that joss is doing for his solo stuff um i totally dig it it's got like more thrash elements to it and um, I'm looking forward to uh, checking that out uh, live. Uh, I love seeing Hatebreed throw down, but uh, when Joss is on stage, you know, it really doesn't matter what he's playing. He uh, he brings it always 100%. Um, and you got a fan for life out of Demon Scar. And again, thank you. Also, thanks to uh, Opus from uh, Dead by Wednesday. He's the one that set us up with this show uh, for um, the uh, the thirtieth thirtieth anniversary of Hate Breed at the uh, in Wallingford. So uh, just looking forward to uh, tearing it up with those guys again pretty soon. Um, all right, I have uh, some plugging to do, and then uh, we're gonna put this uh, episode to bed because I feel like uh, I. Did everything that I set out to do today, and I, I'm I'm proud of myself. I came back; it was nice and smooth. I uh, didn't have uh, as much ring rust as I thought I would have. Um, shit, I feel like I could talk all night, but I won't do that. I will spare you kids that. Um, so on the horizon, like I said, Demon Scar has a new single out um, next week, next Tuesday. June 11th, Moral Design. Uh, that's our new single that's going to be out. Uh, I can't wait for that. It's also, uh, I feel like each song that we release now, it's like heading in the right direction. We're getting a lot of positive feedback. Um, doing that. Now it's like a triple vocal attack. Um, and it's it's just pretty awesome. So, uh, yeah, we're, uh, we're dropping that next week. Um, on June 22nd, I am doing a show at Bar Frida. That's, uh, in Queens. I'm going to be doing that with, um, with Fury and, uh, Trey and Dr. Giggles and Lex the Hexmaster, Jake Palumbo and Jay Cruz. Um, that's in Queens. It's going to be an early show, so uh, make sure you come and check that out. Again, the, the, the Nizza solo stuff is way different from the um, from the Demon Scar. You know, I do, uh, it's more of an alternative hip-hop kind of thing, and uh, it's, it's cool. I, I enjoy myself on these shows and everything, and I've played a few shows already with uh, Fury. He's a good cat. And I uh, put he's gracious enough to uh, put me on this, and also coming up, he also put me on another show, which is the weekend of August thirtieth to the first at the Jewel Music Center. It's Lethal Weekend, and uh, that is a stacked lineup. Um, it's basically three nights. Cottonmouth Kings and First Jason are going to be on Friday. Um, Ron Killings, who's also known as R Truth from WWE, he also does hip hop. He's going to be doing a set on Saturday night, and then um, the third day, that's where I'm going to be on. I'm going to be with uh, Lex the Hex again with Fury and Tricks Don't Do It. Uh, it's going to be an awesome weekend, and that's going to be in uh, Manchester, New Hampshire, at the Jewel Music uh, venue. Tickets are on sale right now. You can get a pass for all three days for $90 or the single day pass for $35. And it's cool. It's different uh, different vibes. Like they, the first night, 
looks like it's more of like a hard bands and stuff are going to be playing. And then, you know, it falls back into the hip hop for the days two and three. So it's a little for something for uh, for everyone. And um, that's uh, that's going to be, again, the weekend of August 30th and September 1st. Now, somebody else I want to give a shout out to that uh, did reach out to me when I was in hiatus. And that's uh, Mr. Steve Beery. Um Papa, I, I really appreciate you reaching out to me. Um, it goes way beyond, like our friendship goes way beyond just me coming to your place and having a good time and playing with the bands and stuff. Uh, you've always been a supporter of mine, and in turn, I've always will be a supporter of yours. Uh, you've always been my sponsor in here, and you continue to do so, and I really do appreciate that. Go check out Mr. Beery's. Uh, it's like the CBGB's of Long Island. There's always something going on. Now they're having Monday night, uh, Monday Oki. Uh, I went and did it. It was awesome. Kevin Mundy bartends. And uh, a lot of people go down there and do their thing with the uh, the, the vocals and singing some, uh, some fun songs and stuff. Uh, I believe this month, every Wednesday, Let It Bleed, the Rolling Stones tribute's going to be there. Those guys are always fun, and um, it beats paying $400 to see the real thing. You can go to Mr. Beery's, pay the cover of 10 bucks to get in and have a good time, and it, you're right up close, and they sound really good. Um, this weekend, they do have a uh, couple shows going on. On um, Actually, tonight also. Uh, they're doing uh, open mic, which is the best open mic night going on right now. Uh, M- Murphy's Music is sponsoring it. They help with the backline and all that stuff and all the sound. So uh, it's pretty cool. So on Friday, the 7th, uh, Bitters and Distractions, Gone Stereo, Fat Heaven, and Will Romeo are playing. And then on Saturday, uh, our friends Bad Mary, they uh, they are headlining a show. They always up the bar every time they play. Um, it's just, Bad Mary is just like one of those bands that make you want to play better like when you, when you have a gig with them. I love having gigs with them because like their energy and their uh, enthusiasm shines on stage and they're cool off stage too, you know. And it's always good to have those those types of people around you. You know, it's just like playing with my friends like Steven and Not Steves and Sharp Violet. I always have a great time with them. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that does it for now. Uh, this has been Primal Scream. And uh, I appreciate everyone, again, reaching out to me and... Um, I see Christine standing at the door right now. She's ready to uh, get in here and do her true crime obsession, which is my true crime obsession because we talk and we share little uh, things. But again, everyone, I'm Nick Greystone, and you're not, and I will see you next time. Later. Thank you for listening to Primal Scream. I'm Nick Greystone, a.k.a. The Nizza. Each week, Primal Scream is produced by Tony Walker and executive produced by Demon Scar. Always remember, nobody writes your story but you. Later. Thank you for listening to...